This is StoryBeat, Storytellers on Storytelling, an exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. My guest today, Maya Danziger, has been acting professionally since the age of 16. She made her stage debut in the Broadway production of The Waltz of the Toreadors with Ann Jackson and Eli Wallach. Since then, she's appeared extensively in theater, on television, and in film. She had long-running roles in the daytime series Another World, The Doctors, and All My Children. Maya starred opposite Beatrice Strait in The Garden Party for PBS and played Vanessa Redgrave's eldest daughter in My Body, My Child. Sarah Jessica Parker and Cynthia Nixon played her sisters. And she won a Daytime Emmy Award for her portrayal of a teenage alcoholic in the after-school special The Late Great Me. Maya is a founder and former artistic director of the Actors Company Theater in New York and a founding member of Rogue Machine Theater in Los Angeles. Maya authored Relax and Write, Tapping Your Unconscious for Life and Art, which we'll talk a lot more about today. She teaches ongoing Relax and Write classes in Los Angeles, online, and at retreats all over the world. I'm very proud to say that I spent three amazing years as a weekly participant in Maya's Los Angeles Relax and Write workshop, for which I remain ever grateful. For more information, please go to relaxandwrite.com. It is my great honor and truly distinct pleasure for me to welcome the awesome force of nature, better known as Maya Danziger, to Storybeat today. Maya, welcome to the show. Thank you. That was very sweet. (laughs) (laughs) So tell us a little bit about your history. Obviously, you've been at the game of acting for quite a while. Um, How old were you when the the bug first bit you, when you thought, wow, I Um, want to do that? Well, that's an interesting story. I mean, my dad was a Broadway conductor, Mm -hmm. and for most of my childhood, he conducted My Fair Lady on Broadway, the original production. Wow. So I saw the show when I was six. It was my first Broadway show. I had seen, I think I'd seen a couple of other little shows elsewhere before, but I was, you know, I was introduced to the top of the top. Um, So I had a, a great sort of longing and passion for theater that started young. But I don't think I ever, it never even occurred to me it was something I could really do. I mean, musical theater, I wasn't a singer, so right. musical theater was a little out of my reach. And But when I was 12 years, 11 years old, I guess, I was in, in seventh grade, um, a young girl who was in my seventh grade class wanted to take an after-school um, acting class at the 92nd Street Y. Right. Um, and she was shy and didn't want to go by herself. So her parents uh, offered to pay for me to go with her. I think she lasted about two days, and I was in for life. I mean, I just I, I arrived there at 11 years old and went, oh, this is who I want to be. This is what I want to do. It, so it, it got its hooks. It got its hooks. About then. It got its hooks in you real early. It, it got it. It got its hooks right in <laughs> me. And actually, it was a an amazing program, and uh, a lot of professional actors did that. You know, as 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 preteens and teens, and went on to have big careers. It was uh, including my husband. <laughs> right. <laughs> he and I were in a in a show together uh, when we were about fourteen and fifteen. Oh, wow. Um, I know it's hilarious. It's very funny. It was so uh, all of us went to that program, and um, and then because I was in New York, I was you know extremely fortunate. Like, you know, I literally in those days could walk out the door, and somebody would say, "Hey, you want to be in a movie?" You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's that, kind of how it happened. That doesn't happen so much anymore, I don't think. Pro- well, you know what. Probably does. New York is a very small town. I don't think it happens out in LA so much. Mm-hmm. Not out on the street all that often. But um, in New York, 
work, I would be willing to bet there's a lot of, you know, I was cute. <laughs> I was redheaded. So, you know, people, people, you know, people would come up to me and they would say, hey, you know, you want to be in a commercial? You want? That's how I got my first commercial. Somebody stopped me on the Fire Island Ferry. Really? And handed me a card from Ogilvy and Mather and said, I'm, I'm the director. I'm shooting a commercial. Would you come in for an audition? Wow. I made him give me the cards. I was very street smart. I, was, <laughs> I, made, I said, do you have a card? I didn't trust him. <laughs> but he did have a card, and I went in, and I auditioned, and I got the spot, and it paid for me to go to college. And those days, commercials... Um, Paid a lot of money. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Anymore. Did did yeah. it did it immediately become a compulsion for you or a, a, a sort of a calling? Um, it was definitely. I mean, it was where I felt alive. It was where I felt I could be me. Mm-hmm. You know, I felt I felt that that was that was where my passion lay. And I went to a I went to an all girls high school, uh, which is now no longer all girls. Um, actually, Lin Manuel Miranda graduated from Hunter. I went to Hunter High School oh, wow, in New York, okay. but they had a fantastic um, theater program there. I mean, a really first rate. And um, so I became part of the, you know, the theater program there and got to, you know, I got to act all my way through high school. Uh, and because it was an all girls school, I got to play a lot of guys. You know, I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I remember my favorite part I ever played was um, the, the, the evil... Irish teacher, Mr. Slogan, and uh, Sean O'Casey's I Knock at the Door. <laughs> and it was, I think, the first time I really experienced a character kind of taking me over. And I thought, ooh, this is awesome. <laughs> that, how, how old were you when you played that? I was probably about 15, 16. So, so not exactly cast for age. <laughs> not cast for age or for, or for you know, or that or same for... year I played... Uh, Mimi and Mrs. McSing, the the little girl, you know, huh. Mrs. McSing's daughter. Where you know, I had this opportunity to sort of, you know, we had to play everything because we were it. So, so I got all these great opportunities to do it and to stretch myself and, to, uh, you know, to, to experience what it is to go. I can do that. <laughs> were you Were you taking classes outside of Hunter as well? Um, I, at this 92nd Street Y program, I stayed there till I was about 14 or 15, I think. And then, um, you know, I, I graduated high school at 16, and then that following, I got into Yale and NYU uh, for theater programs. So the following fall, I, I chose NYU, which was like the hip school in those days. Mm-hmm. I think I was, I think I was a little intimidated by Yale. <laughs> it, was a... it was the first year they were taking girls in the program there. Did, did you stay? Um, at, did you stay at home? Um, I didn't stay at home. I, I went to NYU for the first year and met my boyfriend instantly and moved into his apartment in the East Village. Oh, wow. And then um, actually left after a year and came to Los Angeles with him because he was striking out to, to come here, and I thought I would try that out. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, in those days, not a great thing for me to have done, although I did get a little moody. <laughs> And when I got that little movie, I took that money and got myself back to New York, which was where I really wanted to be. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, w- early, early mm-hmm. on, um, what was who inspired you? What was the who were the people that you looked up to? Um, you know, I saw, and I can't even remember. I guess it must have been a member of the wedding. I saw Julie Harris pretty early on, right? And I was blown away. I thought, oh, I, you know, that's what I want to do. That's who I want to be. Um, I mean, obviously, I was exposed to musical theater, and you know, Rex Harrison and Julie Andrews would come to the house and stuff like that. Mm. But that was uh, not available to me. You know, my my father was a very old world musician, and I didn't have perfect pitch, and I didn't have you know a glorious voice. So it was very clear that musical theater, in his mind at least, which was then in my mind, was completely you know out of my range. Um, but I, I went to the theater often. I mean, that's really what I did with my babysitting money as a preteen. It's what I did with my birthday money. If, you know, if anybody said, what do you, you know, can I get you something? It was always, I want to go, but in those days you could go to the theater for five bucks you know, <laughs> or three bucks or whatever. So I saw everything. I really, I loved being in a dark theater. Now you, now you need $800 to go to the theater. Oh my God. I know it's. Crazy it now. is crazy. Never would have thought, and yet you know, 
Steve, it gives me such joy when I, you know, I live in Los Angeles now, but when I go, well, I live both places now, I'm quite lucky, but when I'm back in New York and I go to the theater and I see thousands and thousands of people, I mean, going to the theater, mm-hmm. bringing their children, and I know, you know, this is costing them, this is their vacation money, this is everything, and yet they still come and they still bring their children, and it's, I think, just such a... Uh, a joyful and positive sign that um, the art is not dead. Mm-hmm. People love to see live theater, and they appreciate it. And so many young people, I mean, just amazing. It, it is, because every every few years we hear about the death of the American theater, and it just, mm-hmm. it's, uh, as they say, the greatest living corpse. Um, it, yeah. It, greatest living. <laughs> it, it uh, It's going to go on forever. The theater's been around forever, and it's going to go on forever. It's just a question of how much it's going to cost to get in. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, um, okay, so you were you were working along. You finally got cast at, what, 16 on Broadway? Is that right? Um, no, I was 20 when I got that show. I moved to, I, I was in school at 16, um, 16, 17. I moved to Los Angeles for a couple of years with my boyfriend, I hated Los Angeles in those days. I didn't drive, and the whole thing was intimidating and crazy. And I really wanted to get back to, to New York and, and my my theater roots. So I um, I got a little movie in Los Angeles. I got myself back to New York. Um, and pretty much within that first year, I think, year and a half, um, I started doing commercials, which was a big boon for me because, you know, I could make money. Um, and then I got uh, I got uh, cast in in the uh, production of Waltz of the Toreadors, and that kind of got me, you know, sort of on the map and started. I also did that same year. I did the Garden Party. Oh, same year. The adaptation of the Catherine Mansfield story for the PBS. Uh, it was the beginning of the PBS short story series that they had for several years. Mm-hmm. So in between yeah. um, school, Hunter, and then NYU, mm-hmm. and then uh, mm-hmm. doing this for, as a profession, at, at what point, or perhaps after, you tell me, did you feel like you were actually good at it? Did you feel it right away? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, the test, my my test for myself was always, I was very practical, you know, having been raised <laughs> by a musician. Mm-hmm. Um, we never knew where the next job was coming. I mean, My Fair Lady was an incredible blessing for my family because it ran for seven years. Right. So as my mother said, we had fresh money every week. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had, you know, vague memories of the years before when my father would be out of work for long stretches. And the years after where he really, he became a music educator and... I hated the instability of um, of not you know always being told we didn't have enough money and we couldn't spend and you know it was we were good now but we didn't know where the next job was coming from even within my fair lady years it was um, you know maybe the show won't last you know the, the kind of I hated that sense of it so for me the I needed to know that I was going to be able to make a living at whatever it was I did and. Um, I, as soon as I started making money and realizing that I could, you know, that I that other people, the test I gave myself after high school was I, I auditioned for Yale and for NYU, mm-hmm. and I said to myself, if I don't get in, then I'm probably not good enough to have a professional career. Interesting. Okay. Um, so my third, my other choice was Hunter College, which was a good college, and I was going to go on because a lot of my teachers at Hunter High School. Were, teachers, were professors in the college, and I'd been very interested in classical studies. And I was honors in Latin, and I had taken Greek, and I loved mythology. So I was going to continue to um, study classics and see where that took me. Right. But I got into Yale and NYU, so I figured, and Yale offered me a scholarship, and I thought, all right, well, I guess I'm, I guess I'm not terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it was just a question. I was, I was incredibly lucky. I mean, I, I look at young people now who, you know, wait tables for years before they get a break. Of course. And just so determined. That would not have been me. If I hadn't gotten some success early, I would have walked away. Well, you, I would have done well, something else. Well, you know enough to know but about... I did get success early. Right. You know enough to know about my story that, that, you know, I've had some success as a writer. And people, it's like my students, they all think that I've always been successful. But it was 13 years right. out of college before I started to get paid as a writer. So 
it's, right. it's not always instant. Yeah. It was it was sort of that way for you, where you kind of latched on pretty early. I latched on early. You know, I I I was. I was cute and I was good. I mean, I certainly had talent. Mm-hmm. I look back on my old work and I'm like, oh, it's pretty good, you know. Um, and, but I don't think I felt, because it happened so quickly, and um, I always felt a little, you know, like I was on the job training. Like, my, I had never done summer stock or I'd never done a play anywhere right. when I got cast on Broadway. I made my, I made my, my acting, my theater debut, my stage debut on Broadway. Wow. And, um, wow. you know, thank God it was Ann and Eli who could not have been kinder. And um, the girl who played my sister was Laura Esterman, a wonderful actress. Mm-hmm. And Laura was also, they, they had done it on the road. Um, Ann and Eli's daughters had played the role, and Laura took over. And Laura walked me through it. You know, she was just like, stick with me, you're going to be fine. Because I didn't, I, you know, I was, I, I'd never done anything, you know. So it was, Enormous fun. Uh, Brian Murray directed it. Oh. Nan and Eli were, you know, they were so kind. So, did did, um, did I, getting did getting work that early, big time work that early, did it spoil you in any way? Um, I just think it. I I don't know whether it's spoiled. Did, did you mean, feel lucky? I guess if I look at, I was lucky. But, I guess if I looked at what but, other people were doing, but it, you know, I think. The the game for me was always, can I keep this going? Mm -hmm. You know, is it a one-time fluke? Will there be another job? I mean, that's, I think, every every actor will tell you. (laughs) You know, you finish a job and you go, oh, my God, is anybody ever going to hire me again? Right, Um, of course, of course. (laughs) I guess guess Um, my question, question my really is, at the time, did you know you were lucky or did you not get it at that time? Because sometimes it's a hindsight thing. Um. I think I didn't get it at that time. I think I thought this was what it had to be in order to be real. Mm -hmm. You know, it was validation on a daily basis that I could support myself doing this. I didn't have money from my parents. They didn't, they didn't help out. Um, You know, I didn't have, I had for good or ill. And I actually think it's for good. um, You know, I, I had to make it work. So I said yes to a lot of jobs that maybe, you know, my father, who was the great artiste, I remember, um, I got my first soap opera a couple of years, and it was probably 20, I don't remember how old I was, but I was young, and I got a three-year contract on uh, on Another World, and I was thrilled because it was <laughs> it was a contract. Real money. <laughs> you know, I would have paid vacations. Sure. A regular you know, weekly salary in a three-year contract, you know, I mean, it was huge. And I went running, you know, to my dad, so proud of myself. And he just went, oh, you know, soap operas, really? Why would you do that? <laughs> uh, you know, let me know when you're doing checkoff. And I was like, <laughs> I, you know, people are paying me to, I, you know, it was, it was a different point of view. All I ever wanted to be was prof- a professional. I didn't really, I wanted to be really, you know, as good as I possibly could be at everything. And I, you know, I worked hard, and I had wonderful, you know, I was lucky to work with really wonderful people early on. Um, you know, so I, I kind of learned by osmosis. And, sure. um, you know, I mean, I worked with Vanessa Redgrave. I worked with Alan Arkin. I, you know, I worked with, with Anne and Eli. I, I really had wonderful people to, you know, to observe and, and be around. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, I... We're going to come back to the acting, but I kind of want to get on to relax and write mm-hmm. for a little bit. Um, sure. All right. So how did you, where did it come from? Where did relax and write start? We'll talk about what's involved in it in a moment, but where did it begin? Um, well, I mean, a, a big piece of my history is that I've been involved with meditation since I was 18 years old. Mm-hmm. So that was a, an early practice, something, you know, that was a deep part of my life always written my mom was a a poet and um i always wrote you know for myself and and when i started acting and i'd be on set which can be you know long stretches of nothing to do or even be you know i would go out of town occasionally with a show or a a film and you have a lot of downtime i wrote you know wrote short stories i wrote i don't know what i just wrote so writing was always a practice of mine Mm -hmm. a kind of way i stayed connected to myself um, in 
1984, I got diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm. And I, who had been creative my whole life, you know, I never, I never, I never thought about having access to the creative process. It was just that was what we did in my family. So, you know, it was expected that I would be in the arts, and I just sort of went for it. Um, but when I got diagnosed with cancer, I froze. Some some part of me got really shut down. Mm. And I was completely unable to um, to work my way through it. And I knew I needed to process. And writing was my way of processing. I'd always been a big journaler and that sort of thing. But I couldn't get anything out. So I really had to sit down with myself at some point and say, you know, this, this is not good that I'm not I'm unable to express what I fear, you know, any of these feelings. Um, what do I have that's available to me that may help me right now? And I thought, well, I've been involved in meditation. Um, I understand I had done some work in journey work and that sort of thing. I had my acting technique, mm-hmm. which was, you know, I'd been studying for a long time by then, you know, which is all about opening up your creative process. Definitely. And um, so I, I enlisted a couple of friends who were very kind, and I said, I need your help. Let's get together a couple of nights a month, and I, I want you to, you know, to, I'm going to lead a meditation, and then I want you guys to do this and take over the meditation so that I can receive it and see if we can we can help me unlock because I'm, I'm all locked up. Mm-hmm. So I developed the process to really find a way back to myself. And in doing it, I understood um, that I had always taken the creative process for granted. It was just a natural flow. But I began to understand what it's like for people who don't have that natural flow, who haven't been told from an early age, it's okay, you can go here. You know, this is, your imagination is yours to run with. You know, this is what it, this is what it feels like to, to give over. Um, and I, it was basically like teaching myself to walk again. But in doing it, I was able to teach my friends who came with me, who you know, who, who did the process with me to help me. Um, they were getting something out of it. Um, it began to really work for me. It was a very rudimentary beginning of the work that I do now. Sure. Um, but I began to find the keys of, of what it was that helped me to feel safe inside of myself because my body had betrayed me, Um, uh, open, um, sensorily aware, you know, of what was around me. Instead, the diagnosis had frightened me so much that I really had shut down. And I also began doing really well in my treatment, in my chemotherapy treatment, to the point where my doctor, my oncologist at one point said, you're doing way better than most people (laughs) do during (laughs) this. Um, What's going on? And I told him, and when I was done with my treatment, he and my breast surgeon uh, asked me if I would come do this for other people going through it. So I did it on a volunteer basis uh, at Beth Israel Hospital at the time, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a couple of times, you know, to, to get patients through. I was going through a lot of things in my life at that time, and then I eventually moved to Los Angeles. Um, I continued doing it here in L.A. when I moved out. Um, I, Wendy Jo Sperber has a, well, she's died, but it was a foundation that she had created called We Spark, which is out here in the Valley. And um, I did this for a couple of years at We Spark on a volunteer basis with cancer patients. Hmm. And one of my, you know, one of my clients there, a woman going through cancer at the time, I uh, had been a uh, an exec at one of the studios, and at one point she looked at me and she said, you know, you should be doing this for writers. They get writer's block all the time. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting idea. Yes. I, had been doing, I was still acting in those days. I was on the series out here, and um, I, hadn't, I hadn't even thought of it. So I went, oh, that's a great idea. So I put together a one-night um, sample class for free, I don't know, I think seven or eight people showed up, and it went really, really well, and everybody wanted more, so that became my first class. Wow. <laughs> what what, what year was this? I looked up, and I had too many people for that. That was probably, I, I would say, 2001, so, maybe 2001, so, 2002, something like that. So you've been doing it almost 20 years now? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it gradually, the you know, the classes just kept building and growing, and my acting career was not building and growing, you know, <laughs> my move to Los Angeles, it, 
at, at 49 years old was not a career move. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was a, it was a life move. And I was very clear that I was willing to do something else with my life. You know, I, I left a career in New York. If I just stayed there, I would have continued with that. Um, but the move out here was really a move for my life. And this work really flourished out here for me. Mm-hmm. Ex- and explain as a, I, as a sidebar, explain yeah. to the listeners why you would be able to continue your career in New York at 49, but it's much harder in L.A. Can you explain why? Well, first of all, I was a known entity in New York. I'd been working there since I was a teenager. So everybody knew me, all the casting directors knew me, you know, my my body of work. And I'd done a fair amount of theater, so, you know, theater is a, an equal opportunity employer. Right. You, you, you can get older in theater. I had never been, um, you know, any kind of a movie star. Um, you know, I, I, I'd never, I'd never really come, I'd come out to L.A. to do a couple of small things, but mostly my whole career had been in New York. Mm-hmm. So I hadn't, I hadn't done the L.A. thing, and a lot of the Los Angeles, and I, not strictly, because so many wonderful New York actors have big L.A. careers, but I think, you know, coming out here is an unknown quantity. There's not a lot, lot of work for women of a certain age, period. And in Los Angeles, those roles are going to go to women of a certain age who have been out here and paid their dues in Los Angeles, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. who have the connections, who have the relationships with the directors and the producers. I didn't have that. I was coming out here like a, you know, <laughs> like a 20-year-old fresh-faced young girl, but I wasn't. I was very, very fortunate to get a recurring role on a series when I moved out here that lasted a couple of years. And... Um, helped me to make that transition. And I did a bunch of commercials and that sort of thing. But uh, things were changing. And did, I, you know, I think one of the things as an artist that you have to stay open to, if you're going to have a full life as an artist, is that you have to be able to see the, the winds shifting and move, move with that shift. You really have to, you have to call it. Um, how, and I was fortunate. You, go ahead. You were fortunate. I'm sorry. I was fortunate that I had this other thing that was growing inside of me that uses all of my, uh, you know, all of my skills as an actor Mm -hmm. come into play. Uh, I also had trained briefly because I think I always knew, you know, getting older in in the business uh, can be dicey. Um, I had trained for four years as an analyst in New York. Mm. Uh, you know, because I'm interested in character and I'm interested in people, and I thought, well, maybe that's something I want to do. And I decided ultimately it wasn't something I wanted to do, but I used those skills um, in relax and write. Uh, I'm a, a good listener. You know, I'm really attuned to what the unconscious is is dealing with, and you know, I love using all of that in service of helping somebody open to their own creative process. Mm-hmm. Is okay. So, back to how this then works. Explain for mm-hmm. the listeners how relax and write how it operates. What do you do? Okay. Well, we start with a twenty-minute meditation, and there are many of them available on on my website for free, free download. Mm-hmm. There's, there's like eight or ten of them. They're up there, and they've been professionally recorded several years ago at the Omega Institute, they, where I teach. Uh, they recorded them for me, and they're available for free on my website if you want them. Uh, we do a 20-minute uh, deep relaxation and guided journey, which uses a lot of acting techniques. So it uses sense memory. It, it, it's geared to help you soften the hold of the conscious mind. So the conscious mind is the part of your mind that's got the critic involved. It yes. tells you you shouldn't be doing this, or who do you think you are, or <laughs> this is no good, or you know somebody, you know all of those things. Mm-hmm. But the conscious mind is very useful. We want to give it the right job. So if we ask the conscious mind to stay engaged with what it might be seeing in your mind's eye as you're, you know, as you're having an experience, what it might be smelling or hearing. Uh, it allows it to be uh, engaged where it should be. And while it's engaged where it should be, it can't be sitting on the unconscious. And the unconscious is where our really deep, rich material uh, as creative artists lies. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's that's where all the stuff we don't know we know has an opportunity to come forward. So 
we do this meditation that is very strongly geared towards keeping the conscious mind actively engaged with what it should be engaged with so people's writing will over time become sharper and more focused mm-hmm. because of that. But it also allows the richness of the unconscious to rise, and then we can begin to work from a very deep place, a very connected place. Um, something that is really, you know, the, the the beauty, the sort of high everybody says, oh my God, you know, I've had a creative experience. It's a, it's a very beautiful experience to be completely lost in your work. But that's when you've really um, created space for the unconscious to come forward. Mm-hmm. Um, so we do that meditation. At the end of the meditation, I say the phrase, when you're ready, you can begin to write. And people pick up their pets and pens or their computers these days sometimes, um, and they begin to write. And the only rule is, there's no wrong way to do the work. The only rule is, don't read what you've written, don't go back and correct it. Just allow it to keep flowing. And from that flow, all kinds of wonderful material comes out as you as you have experienced. It, yes, I have. It, 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 it's a kind of a stream of consciousness, but it's attached for in my case, it was attached to something that I had on my mind and wanted to work mm-hmm. through, and so it yep. was wasn't just coming out of nowhere. There was a, there was a foundation for it. Um, yeah, and I know that there are people that that do the class and don't know what they're going to write that day at all. Don't have any particular thing, and it just comes. Um, exactly. I I tended um, I tended to do the class where I knew I had a goal in mind and I didn't know how to get there, and I allowed the class to bring that up. Well, I, you know, as I said, there's no wrong way to do this work. Um, but, you know, the, the the important thing to know for anybody who's interested in it is it's fine if, you you know, you're working on a project. Come with that intention and mm-hmm. allow your unconscious to help you find your way through it. But even if you just had that urge to write but you have no idea what you might write, that's such a great place to start from. Mm-hmm. So many, I mean, I have students who've been with me. I'm reading actually someone we know, you know, who actually I think brought you to class. I'm reading her manuscript now. She did. Which has taken her about 10 years to get to me. Uh I'm aware. (laughs) I'm very, very well aware. (laughs) (laughs) It's here in my lap. I'm reading it now on a daily basis. Um, But, you know, to, to come and to simply allow the story to find you allow the next thing to happen without controlling it, without it coming from your head, but from coming from a much deeper um, place. It's a little bit like a dream state. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I know, you know, people do a, a, a lot of uh, Julia Cameron's work, who's you know, she's a wonderful teacher, does the artist, created the artist's way. Right. And the idea of morning pages, is the, which is the artist's way, you know, sort of bedrock, um, is that you're catching yourself at that moment between dreaming and waking, when you are open to your unconscious. my What Relax and Write does is give you sort of a reliable, repeatable way of doing that any time of the day. Mm. <laughs> I, the meditation will put you into a slightly altered state where the unconscious is available. And then you allow that material to come forward, because just like in a dream, um things can come in much more unusual and 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 uh, unexpected ways. You know, my, one of my favorite things that happens over and over in class, and I know you experienced it or heard it in the room, is, you know, people will read something and go, I don't know where that came from. Mm-hmm. You know, something beautiful and something moving, they'll burst into tears, we'll burst into tears. I don't know where that came from. They had no idea what they were writing. Um, but it came from them. And... What we want to do is practice being open to our, you know, the wider range of material that is available to us. Mm-hmm. The conscious mind is limited. It, well, that the is... unconscious is unlimited, and we we really want to do the balance between the two. Well, that's that's for sure. Um, do you have any idea how many have been through your courses at this point? Do you have a clue? Oh my God, I have no idea. <laughs> it's got to be thousands, I assume. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you, you you conduct pretty much every one of the meditations, right? Every one of them. Every one of them. <laughs> okay, yep. so as an act, because I know you're using all of your 
you're using all of your skills to do relax and write. I know mm-hmm. you are. Um, yep. How have you been able, after all these years and all these thousands of meditations you've conducted, how are you able to keep it fresh? What is is there any particular trick? Well, that's an interesting thing. I mean, I sometimes think it is like being in a long run of a show because I, you know, in the early years as I was still growing and developing the process, the meditations, you know, changed. They used to be much longer. Now I trust them, you know, over time I shorten. It's, and I finally found a module that really, really works. It's very simple. It's very direct. It really is the balance. So um, I give myself over to it. I experience, I feel very lucky. I mean, I've been involved with meditation my whole life, and I meditate every day. But when I do the meditation for my classes, I'm present with it. So I'm doing it for myself, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm in the experience as I'm leading the experience, and I think that keeps it fresh for me. I I feel the release as I'm as I'm asking you to release in certain ways. I'm aware of my own, you know, sensory cues and that sort of thing. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm, I've also developed the ability to be sort of keep a, a sensory eye on what's going on with everybody in the room because it's my job to hold safe space for people. If I'm asking a group to go into, um, or even a person to go into their own unconscious, it's my job to be a... Um, uh, to hold a safe vessel for them. I think safety, as an actor, the thing I learned very early on is when I felt safe in an environment, I did my best work. When I felt unsafe, which was a lot of the time, sets are often not very safe places. Right. You know? um, uh, I didn't do my best work. I I saved the best of me in a corner somewhere because it didn't feel okay to be vulnerable. So I... I I didn't do my best work there. I feel safety is the key to doing your best work. So that's the thing I I really, really uh, am careful about in my rooms. That you know, as much one can't control everything, but as much as possible to hold safe space for them. Have, have, have you ever but had anybody? I, it, have you ever had anybody um, complain that they didn't feel safe? No, I had somebody once complain that they didn't. They found the material that came up in the room too heavy for them, oh. and that's I can't control that. It's like, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I did, what people people were writing, and that day they had deep things. Somebody's mother had died. Somebody, you know, had been through something else. That was the stuff that came up, and I was like, well, you know, we do deep work here, and if the work is too, you know, is challenging for you, then it's probably not the right room for you to be in. <laughs> but it's. <laughs> It's not, I can't, it's not my job to control what people write. It's, although I, I do, I don't, hate speech is not allowed in my room, but that's never happened. It, so, you, but I, you know, I, I would have a line that I would draw, you know, if there was, a, I felt anyone was attacking anyone in, in that sort of way. But it's never happened. No, I, 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 I have people um, who, my three years, I never experienced anything uh, that was, you know, untoward or weird or, or, no. You know, it's just not, just doesn't I'm happen. a very big believer in uh, that, that the psyche, the psyche self-regulates. I, I think one should never push uh, the psyche. You know, I've been in acting classes where uh, teachers have, you know, pushed for emotional release and whatever. That, I think, is dangerous. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, you know, you don't, you don't know what's going on in someone's background or in their past or in their present uh one should never push for an emotional response but if if one leaves space gently and easily for the unconscious to arise i feel i feel we're in safe hands with our own unconscious Mm -hmm. i feel we are and i think actually one of the great life lessons we all need to learn is that we are in safe hands with ourselves um so as long as you're making gentle, safe space for that part of yourself to come forward. Um, I've never, you know, with the thousands of people I've had, I've never had anything go wrong. Well, well that's... I've never uh, had anybody go, you know... Um, I've never had anything happen. Well, you know, I wouldn't expect it. I just... It I, I, yeah. So it doesn't, no, it doesn't um, surprise me, but, but it's I... It's very gentle work. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's like... You know, it's sort of akin. I I feel like it's a sort of um, it's it's the creative analog of of a, of a yoga class, 
where again you don't push yourself in a yoga class if you I mean obviously people do but but you know if you're in a posture and you can only go so deep you don't you don't want a teacher to come over and go no you can go deeper and push you down because you can hurt yourself mm -hmm. same thing here you go where you are you stay where you are and when you practice over time when it's ready your body releases mm -hmm. same thing with your psyche over time, when it's ready, a new little piece of information will come up. Would, would you I do say? Believe go, go ahead. You that do new believe? No, I, I, you know, I, I believe that 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 we are uh, that our systems ultimately are moving towards wholeness and health and healing. I believe, you know, we, we're. It's one of the reasons I think writing is such a healing art, and it really. I mean, they've done studies on, on you know, people going through various experiences. How important, you know, how how they're. There really is a physiological healing when people write when they they put it out is because we're closed systems. We you know we unless we express and by the way as you know as as a species we are given voice we have language mm -hmm. we have we actually even have written language we are meant to express what's inside of us because otherwise it gets stuck. Yeah. You know, keeping secrets is not a healthy thing, <laughs> would, you know, which is why journaling is such a powerful and beautiful tool. It, it's why therapy works. You express in a safe environment with, you know, another person witnessing. Um, so I think as long as you're not pushing yourself or forcing yourself, but you're allowing material to come out and you're willing to not criticize it, not judge it. I mean, I think non-judgment is the most important thing. Um, uh, it's going to find its way through. We all have a voice. We all have a we all have a story to tell, and we all have a voice to tell it with. And it's just a question of practicing using that voice and not being afraid of what might come out. Because mostly we're afraid that we're going to be judged. Well, as a writer, but there's just care. Yeah. As a writer, um, at some point, judgment does come in. Not during this this session, obviously, but. You at mm -hmm. some point have to make a determination whether what you've written belongs or needs to be edited or what. Yeah, it's... it has to be edited. So their That's judgment where the does come. Mind in. comes in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's a. I, it's funny, but you know, I have students who've worked with me for years, and you know, the relax and write part of me, which is completely, you know, non anything. You know, we every everything is up. We're looking for the gems. We're looking for the you know, the gold, and we're building from that. And then they'll come and they'll bring me a manuscript for me to edit. And I'm like, ah, get rid of that. Get rid of it. And they're like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, nah, that goes somewhere else now. Nah, like, you said that already. It's like, I said, well, now you, have to get, now you have to get tough. Once you've gotten it out, once the, you know, once the baby's been born, you have to grow it up. You have to, you have to make choices. You have to make, yes. you know. But, that shouldn't be seen, and I think, you know, I think young actors run into this, too. You know, when you're given notes by a director, that's not criticism. <laughs> it's notes. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's, it's a helping you to shape a performance. It's a helping you to shape, you know, we're very vulnerable when we create, but we also have to learn that not everything is an attack on us, not an attack on our vault. We need to be able to stay open and vulnerable, but we also need to be able to take uh, suggestions. Yeah, young 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 artists notes. don't know how to take suggestions frequently, and they have to learn it. They do, they do. It's true. I watch you. Know, I'm in a uh, in a singing class right now, and I with a couple of uh, wonderful, talented young people, and I watch how some of them are wide open when they're getting critique. They take it in right away. They go, oh, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. And some of them, their first impulse is to resist mm -hmm. and is to is to get a little sort of cranky Def about defensive, it. Defensive, defensive. And it's, you know, it's like, oof, you know, that that's going to have to soften. You're oh. going to have to be willing to take information in because nobody gets it perfectly. You know, I, I in terms of writing, everybody looks at all the books on a shelf or in a bookstore and they go, They, I think people feel those books were written, you know, in one sitting, <laughs> whole, <laughs> with, with no editing. Oh, involved. yeah. If anybody understood how many hands are, are on a project before it actually finds its way uh, into publication, 
Do you it's think a lot that, of notes that are given. Do you think that the dynamic or the chemistry of whatever group is in a session impacts what's happening in the writing? Um, you know, my experience has been, and I know, I know you were around for it, is that people, you know, there there is a collective unconscious mm-hmm. that that themes will come up in a room when people have been working together. Um, I mean, I, I've actually been in the room where like four people have written about a yellow boat. <laughs> it's like they're all in a dream together, sort of reading each other's minds. Um, I do think that there is a an energetic synergy. Mm-hmm. Um, I also think, and this is a, a you know an experience that I think is really powerful. I do think that a group uh, lifts lifts each other. You know, all the people in the group lift each other. I think being in a group that you trust um, really raises the work for everybody. People build on each other's um, successes and you know give support to one another. It's, I it, think it gives you courage. I think it's. It's a very powerful tool. Uh, the other side of it is if you're in a group where people are uh, critical or competitive, you know, uh, it can shut you down. I mean, mm-hmm. I've, I've been in, the, you know, I did my graduate work as a writer, and I've been in those classes where I don't want to share. Or if I do share, I come away feeling, you know, that I'm terrible and I shouldn't bother. Um, that's, that's not a useful class mm-hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Um, and yet many, many, many uh, classes are run that way, where it's all about the critique, not about the, um, you know, the, the shaping. It's, it's perspective is a very important um, aspect to, to the creative process. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can frame something as a, um, let's, let's see how we can shape this piece. Or you can frame it, frame it as you know. Let's see what's wrong. <laughs> it's, so, so obviously, this is all about relax and write. The key being the second part of it that you've relaxed, but now you've right. got to write. Are, do your do you use your techniques on any other form of art? Um, I've done it with visual artists. I did it with a bunch of plein air artists up in, on the uh, California coast. Um, it works beautifully. It's just not kind of I I'm, I can't. One of the things that I do best, or at least that I've been told I do best, and it seems to be why people come to my classes, is that I'm so I, I love to hear the stories, and I'm really good at picking out where the you know where the gems are. Mm-hmm. When I look at someone's painting, even though my mom was a painter, I I, I can't say you know I, I'm not I'm not in a position to to help someone understand the story of their painting. So. I'm I'm great for getting people in a wonderful space, and then they you know they went and they painted and they shared with each other what they were doing. But I was useless after that. I sat back and had a <laughs> glass of wine and appreciated their lovely their lovely work. Um, I'm I think storytelling is really what you know what I can contribute to. I think I you know as an actor and a writer i think that's a very good sense of the arc of the story of you know the voice of the story of the of the magic and mystery of that and um that's a place where you know where where my input and my feedback i think is very useful mm-hmm. has has relax and write um enhanced developed improved or something like that in terms of your acting um i actually think it has I, I actually think I, you know, the, the the gift it gives me is that while I'm asking you guys to trust, I have to keep trusting. I have to keep stepping forward. And I, I've discovered in the nearly 20 years that I've been doing this that it's actually the less I work, the less I, I, I the more I give over and trust when I'm in the room, the better the class goes. Hmm. And that's something that I really think has translated to my acting, which is that as long as I've done my, I know my lines, I've done my homework, I'm like, you know, I, as long as I've shown up for my rehearsal process, really the idea is to not muscle it, is to not work, is to let it be. Um, and uh, that I think, you know, I've taken a big risk, which I'm about to go public with, you know, public meaning to, to my nearest and dearest friends. Yeah. But, you know, because of my father uh, being the old world conductor that he was when I was very, very young, he told me not to sing. 
you know, because I didn't have perfect pitch and I didn't have Julie Andrews' voice. So I literally shut up at six years old. I mm. didn't open my, I didn't sing happy birthday at birthday parties. I'm, I was absolutely incapable of opening my mouth. And I started singing lessons probably about 10 years ago now. Um, and I'm getting a, a cabaret show ready to wow. in the spring. I hope it'll either be in the spring if I can get the date I want at the place I want, or it'll be in the fall when I get back. Um, which is, you know, a, a, a memoir story, uh, you know, so it'll be story in, in 13 songs. Um, but what I've discovered in the singing for me, and I've had a genius singing teacher uh, without whose help I could never have done this, um, is really the power of, of um, you know, you, you can't muscle singing. It has to be based on relaxation. Mm-hmm. So I really feel that relax and write and my ability now to find my own voice in a way that was taken from me when I was very young, uh, are, are inextricably bound. I really feel that I, what I have learned by teaching relax and write, I'm able to give to myself now, Mm. which has allowed this process to move through me. And by the way, it's the most joyful thing I've ever done. Mm. It's my complete happy place. I take two, I take a singing lesson and a singing class every week when I'm in Los Angeles and I, I, I'll go if I'm, you know, if I'm dying as long as I'm not um, contagious, because I don't want to miss it. It is my happy place mm-hmm. after having been a place of, you know, of absolute terror for me. So the first two years of class, I just cried. That's the um, uh, that's the old adage about you. You hear this frequently from. Um, all sorts of artists, but actors in particular, that they take a role because it scares them, or they do something because it scares them. You should always be a little bit afraid. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit. You should be terrified. (laughs) But sometimes terrified is okay, too. I mean, each of us has to, you know, gauge what's okay for us. But a little bit of fear is a good thing. You're you're not still fearful in front of a class, are you? Um, You know, there's every, every... Not... Not in my <laughs> personal classes, you know, in my ongoing classes, because I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> Nobody comes to my class who doesn't want to be there. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm lucky I don't I don't teach at a university where somebody has to take my class. Yes, and credit and really. You know, yes, this is awful. Uh, yes, I can speak um, to that. <laughs> I, no, yeah, I'm sure you experience it, and it's just it's you know it's part of the game. There's nothing you can do. When I'm teaching, you know, I, I teach at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck. I just got, to, I've been teaching the last six or seven years for them in Costa Rica every year. This, I, there's always a little bit of, oh, it's new people in the room. Um, you know, will they like me? You, you know, it's always, it's, it's always that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's always a, a little bit of performance anxiety, but. You know, again, you you have to go. You're not. Gonna, I'm I'm not everybody's cup of tea, and you know that that's certainly a lesson I've learned as an actor. You get you know you get as much rejection as you get, with sometimes more rejection than you get acceptance. Um, but you know that's part of the game. Mm-hmm. And um, so you know, just a little, a momentary. You know, will I have it today, or will this be the worst class I've ever taught? <laughs> You know, there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> as long as you're showing up, you know, with the intention to be fully present for, you know, that I do do. I've, you know, I've never, I've never worried about my ability to show up completely. Mm-hmm. And if, if I ever find myself struggling with that, then it's time to stop teaching. Mm, yep, yeah, that may be right. Do you, um, do, aside from the meditations and aside from singing and those things, do you do anything else to refresh your own well? Are there other things you do? Um, I'm writing right now. And um, my husband and I are working on a screenplay together. I took uh, nearly a month off this summer. I, I had my classes ongoing online, but I didn't do anything else. I stayed in Maine for a month and... Um, finished her first draft of a screenplay. We've gotten notes from some fantastic people, and I'm going back in as soon as I get a three-week stretch to do the second uh, draft of it, and then you know we'll, we'll begin sending it out. Um, I have to do my own work. If I'm not doing I've always stayed in, in acting class. Mm-hmm. Um, even when I wasn't acting any longer, I always stayed in class because that, to me, uh, is, you know, that's... 
that's my joy. That's my love. I, you know, it keeps me connected to my uh, my own creative process. And if I'm not doing my creative work, if I'm not challenging myself, if I'm not growing, um, I don't think I have as much to give to my students. What What would you say that you're doing these days as an actor that um, you you didn't do in the beginning? How have you grown as an actor? What are you What are the differences? Oh, I'm much. I I used to. Because I started young, and it's interesting, I have a, a couple of other friends in my acting class um, who I actually, you know, knew we were we were young actor, actresses together in New York. Um, so we're sort of of the same age, and we we've all had the same experience. When you start working when you're very young, um, really, you're shaped by the people you work with. You know, the, the people who hire you, the director, and all of that. Sure. So you learn very early on. Um, to figure out what they want, because you don't want you don't want to get fired, you want to keep the job. Mm-hmm. So you learn very early on to please other people, um, and to make it so you give them what they want. Which, by the way, is your job as an actor up to a point. Mm-hmm. But what winds up happening, and I've shared this with a, we, you know, we've had this conversation with these other women and I, is that you kind of make a map. You go, well, they want me to cry on this line. They want me to do this on this line. They want me to, you know, you sort of go, all right, so this is what I do, and this is the map of what I do. And it's a trap. You can't map out a performance. You can, but it's going to, over time, become very thin. You you can't. Um, you know. You so have to be really, in the moment. I, You've got to be in that exactly. moment. Exactly. So for me, uh, I've been studying for the last, oh, I don't know, maybe... 10, 12 years with a a guy out here who's just a genius teacher. Um, And and I've studied with, you know, all the famous teachers in New York and all of that. But I found this guy, and he's he's fantastic. And it's really about, he's really, he's unpacked that whole thing for me. He's he's really created a, you know, a a way of being on stage for me that, um, that allows me to trust. Mm. That you know, I I can I do my my work. I'm aware of everything, and then I'm out and I'm in the moment. And yes, I can get my marks. I can you know I can show up where I need to, but I trust that the that the flow of the work that I'm doing will be appropriate for the moment and a little bit different every every time I do it, as it should be. Um, without me having to, you know, having the safety net of, oh, you know, if I'm lost, I can go, you know, muscle through this moment. I can get angry here. I can get, you know, he's helped me to un- undo all of that, which was a, a very early pattern in my life. Mm-hmm. One of the keys to um, one of the keys that you constantly hear about for so many actors is you must have the ability to relax, and now it's related to relax and write as well. That you that relaxation yep. has to be there. Yep, uh, uh, has to be there. Yeah, you, you it has can, to be there. It's just like singing, where I you mean, say I, you can't I, muscle singing, you can't really muscle acting either. Nope, I don't think you can muscle any creative um, work because I think you know if I if I'm asked, if you ask me to say what is it I really teach, I teach how to co-create with the unconscious. Mm-hmm. Because um, you don't want the unconscious, you know, the unco- you know, oh, good, the unconscious material comes up, and you're in the moment, but you have no discipline with it. You know, if you're an actor and you go, oh, I've, I've worked with those actors, but I'm in the moment, but you never know what they're going to say next, and you never know where they're going to be on stage next. Mm-hmm. That's not okay either. You really need the balance between the two, but if you're not, uh, you know, you, you need the form so that, so that the, the a live material can come forward and be mm-hmm. held by the mm-hmm. form. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, you know, I think it's true in, in everything. Unless you have the access to flow, um, it's the material, you know, whatever you're doing is going to be a little wooden. It's going to be stiff. It's not going to be alive. It's not going to feel present or of the moment, as, yep. we, t- as we already said. Yep. So, Maya, we've been talking for close to an hour, and um, we're going to wind this thing down here, and so I'm going to ask you the famous last two questions of this show. Um, You've obviously met with and worked with lots of different humans over the face of your career, (laughs) both in the entertainment industry and somewhat outside. Um, Do you have an oddball or weird or quirky or offbeat story that you could share? 
Um, you know, I I'm back and forth on two of them, so I'm going to you can do both. You can do both. Do the one that came, do the one that came up, which is an acting story, okay. um, which is a, a very funny and sweet story. I I did a movie in uh, Berlin with Alan Arkin years ago, and uh, it was a very complicated process and crazy people running running the movie and all of that, and it was fraught on every level and Alan was miserable and I was being treated really badly and I, I played his young lover in, in the movie and there's a scene where I'm supposed to be I'm, I'm giving him a bath so it, it takes place in, in the early 1900s and I'm, he's in the bathtub and I'm giving him a bath and in the scene he's supposed to pull me in and start making love to me in the, in the tub <laughs> okay. and the director wanted you know shots of my breast as he takes my thing off it was all very it was all very sleazy and unpleasant, and Alan is an angel. Um, and he he was like he looked at me at one point. He said, "Don't worry, I got you covered." So we start to do the scene, and I'm quite nervous um, because I know they're going to try to tear my you know blouse open and take pictures of my naked breast. Mm-hmm. And Alan pulls me into the the bathtub, and I as he's doing the scene and kissing me. I noticed that in the bathtub with us are all these vegetables, <laughs> like onions and carrots and potatoes. <laughs> and I kind of give him a side eye look while we're in the middle of the scene, and he whispers in my ear, It's a Maya soup. <laughs> well, I started to laugh so hard that I stopped worrying. And we just did the scene, we got it in one take. I didn't. I wasn't concerned about what angle they were getting and whether a little bit of my breast showed or not. He relaxed me. Mm-hmm. He did it with humor. Mm-hmm. So that was one of my favorite stories. Was Maya soup? <laughs> Maya soup. Have you have you ever tried yeah. canning that? No, I think it's a great. Maybe that's my next career. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll put together a little creativity soup and just be done. <laughs> I love the idea. <laughs> did you want? Did you want to tell us the second story? Oh, the other story is uh, the other thing I was thinking about was that I, you know, I, I had as I worked with a lot of Hollywood writers and stuff because I live in Hollywood, mm-hmm. and I had a woman who came to me years ago. You may have been in class with her, um, who's a pretty well known screenwriter and television writer, very very wonderful writer. But she came because she wanted to write a novel and had abandoned that when she came to Hollywood. And she struggled and struggled for, you know, six or eight months. And she could only get little bits and pieces out. And she was so frustrated. And at one point, you know, I just sort of let her go through her process. And at one point, I just leaned over after about six months. And I said, you do know that you're writing poetry. And she was, like, stunned and shocked at the moment. Because she was. She was writing beautiful poetry. And she was like, oh, my God. She said, I used to write poetry in high school. But I never thought of it again. And we flash forward, like, two years, and she has sold her home in Los Angeles and moved to western Massachusetts and bought a beautiful little house on a river and, and the local bookstore, which she now, now runs. And I think she still does some screenwriting from there, but she's writing poetry. Mm-hmm. So my, my story is that I took a very successful <laughs> screenwriter and turned her into a starving poet. <laughs> and by the way, I know exactly, so, I know so exactly who you mean. <laughs> beware is right. I, I know exactly who you mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, well, you know, that's, uh, it's not always about the money, but the money helps. <laughs> well, you know, she was, she was able to do that. She, you know, it was a responsible thing for her to do, and but it was the right thing for her. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, even if you can't pick up and leave, if what you're doing is writing poetry and that's where your heart is, then you need to make sure you continue to do it. That's all. You have to, you have to follow the lead that will take you to your happiness. A- absolutely. Well, that's fulfillment. that's the key. If it makes you happy, that's really what counts. Um, yes. <laughs> so, so finally, do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip that you can uh, lend to those that are either just starting out in the business or or who are p- perhaps trying to get it to the next level? I really do think consistency and showing up is is the answer. I mean, I really think if it's something you really want, um, first of all, there's a million and one ways to live a creative life. You know, I, you can live it very publicly and have a lot of obvious success, which, by the way, has its own um, downsides. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, if, if, if the truth is that you want to live a creative life, there are a million ways to, to, to support that. 
you know, people teach people and do their work on the side. People, you know, there's so many ways to do this sort of thing. But I do think the consistency of just showing up, of not not being self-critical to the point of of um, freezing yourself, but being self-aware, uh, continuing to study, continuing to work. I mean, I if I can sing, <laughs> I'm about to be 69 years old and I'm going to make my singing debut. <laughs> if I can sing, which was an impossibility for me, I mean, truly, I never sang Happy Birthday. Um, if I can say in a couple of months I'm going to go out in front of 100 of my dearest friends and do an hour-long singing show, and they're going to have a blast. They're, it's going to be great. It's really going to be fun. If I can do that, uh, anybody can do anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's taken me, it's because I wanted to. And I was willing to go through the years where all I could do is open my mouth and cry, where uh, all I could do is open my mouth and, you know, not not know how to make a real sound. But bit by bit by bit, um, I've shown up. And the truth is, I'm actually really good at this. I know how to act a song. And it's, I think, really what's coming for me in the future is this. This is This will be my expression. Um, but I showed up for 10 or 12 years. You, uh, it's so interesting. Basis. It, it's interesting to me that you watched, or I'm sure were around Rex Harrison a fair amount. Yes. Sure. So yeah. you, you didn't learn from him <laughs> that, that not being able to well, sing is okay. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I, because I did, uh, three years ago, I did, I did two songs in a, 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 a group of, of, of singers at a, at a cabaret out here. I did two songs, which is how I got invited back, because they went well. And the line I used there was, because my father said, you, you'll never be Julie Andrews. Mm-hmm. And that's what you internalize as a child. When your father tells you, don't sing, you don't have perfect picks, you'll never be Julie Andrews. Of you course. go, well, I won't sing. That's it. I said, you know, the truth is my father was right. I never could have been Julie Andrews, but I could have been Rex Harris. <laughs> <laughs> could have been. Well, but it never occurred to me. Well, I was just told by my dad that I didn't have it and I should shut my mouth. Well, but there's, I did. there's, <laughs> I there's, a good girl. There's only ever years, going to be. I'm not such a good girl anymore. Right, right. There's only ever going to be one Julie Andrews. So. Exactly. <laughs> And and so exactly. you you should never try to be Julie Andrews. You should try to be the best exactly. you. So that's exactly it. But it was you know it's it was just the constant willingness to show up and trust. You know, trust that that, that I can get better at this. Trust that you know I I I have to say honestly that you know I've had people who come into my classes who've never written a word and don't don't know you know really wh- what they might want. To you know, to do and maybe have slightly you know stiff and critical voices. They're beginning their work, but by showing up on a regular basis, I mean, I'm thinking of one person in particular. She's had six stories published this year. Wow! She's been working in about six years. Six stories in different journals. Wow! She found her voice. She found her characters. She started to get confident. Um, she started to have fun. She loosened up, and all of a sudden, she's getting published. I, I also... And she deserves to be. I, but she didn't know that was in there. Mm-hmm. She was following an impulse and was willing to keep showing up to let that voice come out. So, I, I you know, I think the important thing is showing up. And I don't mean in a, you know, like, you know, oh, you've got to sit down for two hours every day. You know, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in sitting down for 10 minutes if you can. Mm-hmm. You can get a lot of work out in 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. I, I also uh, I also know about one person from our from my day back in in the eighties, mm-hmm. who's um, way back then was working on a novel that's about to come out. So that's right. Yep. So uh, there it, you are. It it uh, it is stick to itiveness. It is a long term game. It is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Yep. It is very much so. Which well, doesn't mean you know you can't get a lot of. Great stuff happening early on. Oh, of too. course, you know, of course. You can go anyway, but you have to understand that it's it is you have to be in it for the long haul. That, that's right, mm-hmm. Maya. This has been just a spectacularly fun hour. Um, it's been it was great to talk with you. I've missed 
I've missed having you in the room. Oh, <laughs> well, I've missed being in the room, but it's a little hard for my, my commute. <laughs> Well, I've got my online classes. So. That's, that's true. <laughs> you never know. That's true. Uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I think that there's a lot of valuable information in here. And I'm certainly hope, hopeful that people will try to find uh, their way to you through relaxandright.com and whatever other ways there are out there. Are there other ways to get in touch with you? Great. Um, or is that the way? Relaxandright at mac.com. At, you at can Max. email me if you're interested. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I, would, I teach at the Open Center in New York and at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck and down in Costa Rica. So, you know, I'm around. <laughs> you're, you're findable. I am findable. You uh, can Google me and, and find me that way. I, hi- I highly okay. urge anybody out there who's trying to figure out how to make their writing come alive and find ways to, to complete and, and do things to check out uh, Relax and Write and Maya Danziger. Maya, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Steve. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.